Good evening. I am Councillor Duncan Anderson, Chair of Council. I'd like to welcome you all to this full Council meeting. We're not expecting a fire practice, but in the event of hearing the fire alarm, please leave the chamber, turn right, proceed down the stairway and through the emergency exit on the ground floor. The assembly point is in the public square in front of Cast beyond the fountain. Anybody with mobility issues should wait in the refuge area near the lift and use the intercom to call for assistance. This meeting will be recorded and published on the Council's YouTube channel. By entering the Council Chamber, you're accepting that you will be recorded and your image will be retained and broadcast by the Council. Any members of the public or press are interested in recording or film any part of today's meeting, please ensure this does not disturb the proceedings. Can everyone ensure your mobile phones are switched to silent mode? Item one. Apologies for absence. We have apologies from councillors Joe Blackham, Rachel Blake, and Andy Pickering. Do we have any additional apologies? Yes, Chair. Councillor Barry Johnson. Barry, Thomas Barry Johnson and Thomas Dean. Any additional beyond that? Nope. Then we move on to item two. Consider the public and press are to be excluded from the meeting. There are no exempt items on tonight's agenda. Item number three, declarations of the in, of interest. Do we have any such? Councillor Jane Kiff. Uh, agenda my, uh, item eight, um, I work for a disability charity that provides services such as disability confidence training, reasonable adjustment training um, as a paid service. So I will declare an interest and leave for that item. Thank you, Councillor Kidd. Any other declarations of interest on any item? Nope, thank you. Agenda item four then, minutes of the council meeting held 13th of July, 2023. Are the minutes a true and accurate record? Removed, they seconded. All agreed? Thank you very much. I will sign those at the end of the meeting. Item five, announcements. I have no announcements to make. I understand that Rose Jones has an announcement. Mayor Jones. Thank you, Chair. Chair, I would like to make a brief announcement on our efforts to save and reopen our airport. Colleagues, yesterday I took a report to an extraordinary cabinet meeting to update on the wide range of work that has been underway during the last year and critically into 2023 to find a solution to reopening the site which could unlock millions of pounds worth of investment and jobs. I'm pleased to say that Cabinet provided their unanimous support to the Council's efforts for this, and I thank you. Although there are still hurdles to overcome, we are making progress. A huge amount of work has been done to get us to the point, and I want to place on record my thanks to all Council officers and partners who have contributed to the project so far. The next step is to obtain an airport operator this procurement exercise will commence on Monday and run through until March 2024. Reopening Doncaster Sheffield Airport is my number one priority. A positive outcome would mean so much to local communities and businesses and underline our ambition as one of the UK's newest cities is crucial. We are hopeful that a lease can be secured and look forward to working with interested parties in the reopening of our airport. We have already initially tested the market for those industry experts who can partner with us to get the airport reopened as soon as we can. If we get the lease agreed, then reopening the airport will not happen overnight, of course, but it would be a huge step forward. I do hope that we can share good news soon and continue the journey to reopen our airport. However, there are still very significant challenges ahead. A lease must first be agreed with the current landowners on acceptable terms. The decision to fully close the airport rather than continue aviation operations as we originally proposed has added significant cost and uncertainty to the opening process. However, we believe we have an exceptional asset that can be the jewel of the crown for South Yorkshire and beyond. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Ross. Uh, Deputy Mayor, do you have any announcements? I have.
have none, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn. Uh, Councillor Smith, I understand you have an announcement. Thank you. Um, I'd like to make a brief announcement about the Choose Kindness movement and its launch this weekend. Choose Kindness is a citywide movement that aims to promote acts of kindness and the positive impact that it can have on people, place, and planet. This is not something new, and it's actually about building on the existing positive things that are already happening across the city and making them even stronger. It's a reminder that we all have the power to make a difference to each other's lives, whether that's a small gesture or getting involved in projects to support others and the environment that we live in. These small gestures that can create a chain of reaction of kindness and brighten up somebody's day. They can range from checking up on vulnerable neighbors, particularly during the winter months ahead, and going out into the community and doing voluntary work through to more formal opportunities, such as considering becoming a foster carer, all to which contribute strategically to supporting key priorities areas across the council. The movement started from conversations with community members who wanted to talk to each other to celebrate all the good that is about Doncaster and what's happening and their belief that if we all work together, we can ensure everyone in our community experiences kindness and the differences this makes to everyone in a multitude of communities. This, these initial conversations continued with Rachel Blake helping to organize meetings to facilitate this. And this movement is a collaboration of stakeholders, including residents, volunteers, community partners, councillors, and Team Doncaster. This is not a social media campaign for a limited period of time, nor is it telling people what to do. It is a movement of individuals with the support of organizations who believe in the power of kindness. It is important to remember that kindness costs nothing, but the impact can have its re far reaching and impact on individuals, communities, and the wider city and planet. Likewise, this movement is not costly to the council, Evia. This is a standalone budget for the movement. We are making use of resources and incorporating the movement into existing activity. For example, this week's launch at Cusworth Hall launch, working with Doncaster Voices, an event that was already taking place. Partners are also supporting and contributing where appropriate. For example, some team Doncaster partners have contributed financially to enable Choose Kindness to sponsor the Heart of Doncaster Awards, which is closely aligned to the values of the campaign and celebrates and champions kindness and community spirit. You will all have been invited to the launch of the movement this Saturday evening at the beautiful Cusworth Hall, where Choose Kindness will feature as part of a premiere of Doncaster Stories, all collect a collection of more than 20 people sharing their own stories of life in Doncaster and across Doncaster. The evening will also feature local voices talking about what kindness means to them and there'll be an opportunity to sign up to the Choose Kindness Pledge. More info about getting involved and taking the Choose Kindness Pledge can be found at Your Life Doncaster website and I really look forward to seeing everybody there on Saturday. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Councillor Cole, I understand you have an announcement. Thank you, Chair, and I hope you don't mind if I uh, stand. Um, I'd like to make a statement concerning the Council's finances, and I hope that members will bear with me. Members will be aware of the difficulties facing councils across the country, councils declaring bankruptcy at an unprecedented rate, with Section 114 notices recently issued by Conservative-run councils Thurrock and Woking, and Labour run Croydon, Slough, and most recently, Birmingham. Only last week, we've seen stark warnings from Kirklees, Derbyshire County Council, Kent, and York. The Conservative Council leader of Derbyshire County Council, Barry Lewis, said, we are continuing to lobby the government for extra funding so we can continue to run vital services, but we also recognize that even more difficult decisions will be needed to be made to try to balance the books. Derbyshire faces a £46 million overspend which will wipe out its reserves. Birmingham faced an £87 million overspend prior to issuing their Section 114 notice. Doncaster is a member of SIGOMA, the Special Interest Group of Municipal Authorities, a group of 47 urban authorities. 
Sigoma reported that one in five of its members are likely to face this very situation in the next year. You may ask, what has led to so many councils of different political colours to be so close to bankruptcy? The answer lies in three parts. Core government funding. As recently as July 2021, the National Audit Office used DLUC, uh, that's the government department's data, to estimate that total funding across England was set to fall in real terms by 52.3% between 2010-11 and 2020-21. More recently, the House of Commons Library reported in June that, quote, despite an increase in 2023-24, the amount of central government grant funding received by local authorities has decreased markedly in real terms over the last few years, and that is mostly consistent across local authorities. As has been reported during our budget process, Doncaster Council has seen its core funding reduced by 27% in real terms since 2009-10, compared to an average of 20% for a typical English authority. That is the equivalent of £340 less to spend on services for every resident Loss of core funding has ramped up pressure to increase council tax. But as this is capped by government, the Institute for Government estimates that council spending has fallen in real terms 31% between 2009-10 and 2021-22. So loss of core funding from government is one factor. The second factor is inflation, energy prices and pay which the LGA estimates will add £2.4 billion needed to be found by, from local government budgets in this financial year alone. And finally, the pressure to support our most vulnerable residents is ever growing. To demonstrate this, in 2020-21, we, City of Doncaster Council, we spent 57 pence in every pound on children's services and adult services, including public health all vital services. This year, that figure will be 67 pence in every pound that, uh, of our revenue budget. So the pressure is growing year on year. This year, overspend on both adult and children's services costs, which are significantly over budget already in this financial year, demonstrate the challenge we face. At the end of quarter one, we have an estimated 4.16 million overspend forecast for this year's budget. So what will we do? The Council will continue to review our spending. It will take active measures to mitigate or offset those pressures to reduce our forecast year-end overspend. However, I have to advise Council that we face very tough choices, including possible cuts to other services, to prioritise those vital frontline services that we have to deliver by law. There will be no easy choices. I can advise Council that under the leadership of Mayor Ros Jones, the City of Doncaster Council remains a financially well-managed local council, delivering important services and providing value for money to residents. Based on current projections, I am pleased to say we do not envisage having to issue a Section 114 notice any time in the foreseeable future. However, I cannot stress enough to members the difficult and volatile financial position this council and local government generally is facing, and I welcome your support as we navigate this financial environment. Thank you. Thank you. Bill, does any other member of Cabinet have any announcements they wish to make? No, in that case, I understand that the Chief Executive has. I do. Thank you, Chair. Uh, as members may have seen from its circulation on the 1st September, uh, the scheme of delegation for executive functions has recently been updated by Mayor Ros Jones. Under the Council's constitution, I am required to report these changes to full Council. The latest revisions to the scheme largely comprise updates to the functions listed under each director and their respective assistant directors in order to reflect the outcomes from the corporate functional realignment exercise that was undertaken across the Council early this year. For example, the scheme shows that we, have, we now have a Chief Executive Directorate 
which incorporates the public health and policy insight and change functions, amongst others. Alongside this, other directorate titles and function areas have also been updated. There have been no significant changes made to the cabinet portfolio lists set out in the scheme, other than minor changes to mirror the updates made in the directorate listings. One other minor change has been made in order to move these functions listed under community safety from Councillor Nigel Ball's portfolio, uh, Public Health, Communities, Leisure and Culture, to Councillor Joe Blackham's portfolio, Highways, Infrastructure and Enforcement. The updated scheme of delegations can be viewed alongside all other parts of the Council's constitution on the Council's website. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Damien. Agenda item six, then, is our questions from the public. We have two questions today. As they're on the same subject, I will read them both together, and then Ros will provide a joint response. First question from Mr. Martin Butterworth. City of Doncaster Council, CDC, neighbourhood response team is actively challenging offenders who are fishing illegally on the lake at Lakeside. It has amassed a large body of evidence of offences being committed by a considerable number of offenders. Yet not one of these offenders, including several persistent offenders, has been prosecuted. Will the Mayor instruct CDC's law, enforce, law officers to ensure action is taken to prosecute offenders for illegal fishing under CDC's bylaws? And will she also liaise with the police to prosecute offenders under the Theft Act for theft of CDC's fishing rights? The second question is for Mr Kevin Pritchard, as follows. Recent posts in the Bessica Lakeside group garnered circa 200 comments complaining of illegal fishing at Lakeside. Local residents have spent many hours on the phone reporting to the council's ASB helpline, countless more providing video, photographic and written statements of evidence the crime, to, cr to evidence the crimes under the council's bylaw and provide assurance of eyewitness attendance at court. There is respected research evidence that shows low-level crime unpunished leads on to more serious crime. The council has made repeated insurance that it will prosecute offenders. When will it de do so? Mayor Jones, would you like to respond? Thank you, Chair, and thank you for your questions, Mr. Butterworth, and Mr. Pritchard. And as the questions are related, I will answer both together with one answer. The standard of evidence required by the court in order to bring a successful prosecution for breaching the council's bylaws at Lakeside is very high. Some previous reports of fishing activity were not sufficiently detailed to sustain a prosecution. We have now received what we consider to be compelling evidence and the council's legal team are working with the investigating officers with a view to submitting a prosecution file to the court. The council's neighbourhood response and enforcement teams are aware of these issues and will be monitoring the area carefully for future breaches and if found we will look to prosecute other offenders. Thank you for your question. Thank you Mayor Jones. I understand Mr Butterworth is in the chamber this evening. Would you like to ask a supplementary question? Would you please come forward to the microphone. Your supplementary question should not be a statement and must arise directly out of the original question or the reply given. Please make your question as direct, concise and succinct as possible. Okay. Uh, my question um, referred specifically to liaison with South Yorkshire Police about prosecuting offenders under the Theft Act for theft of CDC's fishing rights. And I emphasise fishing rights rather than theft of fish. The answer I have in front of me Thank you very much for that. But I'm afraid um, it doesn't say whether CDC is liaising with South Yorkshire Police with a view to prosecuting offenders under the Theft Act. So I therefore ask, has CDC complained to SYP that its fishing rights are being stolen on a daily basis? Unless it does so, SYP will not be able to intervene to investigate these, offenders, these offences under Schedule 1 of the Theft Act. So the question is, just to repeat, has a complaint been made to South Yorkshire Police for these offences that have been going on now for several years? Thank you, Mr Butterworth. Can I ask the Mayor to respond? Thank you for that. Uh, I will ensure 
that uh, we continue to collaborate with the police in order to deliver what we can for the residents of our borough. And thank you. Thank you, Mayor Jones. Uh, I understand Mr. Pritchard is in the chamber this evening. Would you like to ask a supplementary question? If you'd like to step forward. Thank you for taking these questions tonight. It's quite obvious you've got far more serious things on your platter than this. I'd also like to thank you very much for the work you've done, specifically on the airport, because that must be absorbing too much of time. Anyway, thanks for the response. A um, couple of questions for clarification, really. Very, very brief, very succinct mm -hmm. questions. One, the response says the council's legal team are working with investigating officers with a view to, with a view to submitting a prosecution to court. Not the same as we will be submitting a prosecution to court. Can I have some assurances that that gives me a little bit, bit more, gives us a little bit more of a warm feeling that this is definitely going to happen. The other thing is you've got a list of suspects. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pritchard. Can I invite Ross to respond? I will over to uh, our director of legal services. Thank you. I can assure you that we're dealing with it, that we're looking into it. We have some evidence. We're trying to put that together into a form that we can use. It is a high standard for us to pursue, but we're definitely considering it. We're not kicking it into the long grass. We're not kicking the can down the road. Thank you. Mr. Pritchard, I really can't take interjections in this manner. Uh, I'd like to thank you both for presenting your questions to council. And uh, I hope you got a response you would appreciate. Item seven is revision of the council's contract procedure rules and financial procedure rules. Chair of Audit Committee, Councillor Austin White, will introduce this item. Councillor White. Thank you, Chair. This report sets out the proposed revisions to the council's contract procedure rules and the financial procedure rules. The overall aim of the revisions is to ensure the contract procedure rules offer best practice contracting opportunities. Councillor White, could you uh, move your microphone a little closer to you? We're not quite picking you up. Would you like me to start again, Chair? Thank you. This report sets out the proposed revisions to the Council's contract procedure rules and the financial procedure rules. The overall aim of the revisions is to ensure the contract procedure rules offer best practice contracting opportunities, deliver, deliver effective governance and are legislatively compliant. And the changes to the financial procedure rules ensure they provide greater clarity to managers, are practical to use and ensure financial decision making is made at the appropriate level. These documents form part of the Council's constitution and therefore require approval by full Council. The Audit Committee considered and endorsed the proposals on the 12th of September. Members of the Elections and Democratic Structures Committee were also invited to this meeting with some members in attendance. As Chair of the Audit Committee, I ask Council to approve the report. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Austin. Does any member wish to speak on this item? If so, please press the large red button on your console. I'm not seeing any indications. In that case, we have had, a mo had it be moved and seconded. All oh, agreed. This is unanimous. Item eight then is motion from Councillor Leanne Hempsall. Can I ask Councillor Leanne Hempsall to introduce the item? Thank you, Chair. Disabilities are not always visible. People with disabilities make up 21.7% of Doncaster's population. This figure is higher than the national average at 17.9%. People with disabilities just want to live as normal a life as possible. The vast majority can and do want to work. For far too long, disabled people have not enjoyed the same em employment opportunities as the wider working population. The employment gap between disabled and non-disabled people has remained persistently large, approaching 30%. Despite this, there is no evidence that significant change is in sight. 
The Disabilities Employment Charter was launched in October 2021. The purpose of the Charter is to petition the government to introduce change and level up opportunities for disabled people seeking and in employment. Organisations which sign the Charter are showing support for the introduction of these measures for change. The objectives of the Charter are to increase employment opportunities and job satisfaction for disabled people, reduce disability pay gaps, benefit the taxpayer and support the UK's post-pandemic pandemic recovery by providing employers with the widest possible talent pool to address skill shortages. As a council, we already do a great deal to support and encourage opportunities for those with a disability. And I'm pleased to hear that we are reviewing our full recruitment process. A disability confident employer and a strength based approach to workplace adjustments and reasonable adjustment guidance. If the disability employment charter is adopted by government, it would further support us as a council and the wider public sector to become more inclusive employers. This charter outlines the action the government needs to take to address the disadvantages disabled people encounter in their everyday working lives. This disability employment charter is an important next step. I therefore urge the City of Doncaster Council to support this motion and ask that we lobby government to bring in legislation or regulations as part of, the, as part of their disability strategy which adopts measures requested in the Charter. I so move, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Leanne. Uh, I understand that Councillor Gunnar Smith is going to second the motion. I wish to second this motion. I have made no secret of the fact that I spent my entire career in the support of vulnerable adults, which makes me a very lucky person. I want to not just second this motion, but to give it my absolute support, as should we all. I am fully aware this charter requires government consideration from a national perspective, but would like Doncaster to be seen as leaders, not followers here. And this demonstrates to others what Doncaster believes is important. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Glynis, does any other member wish to speak on this item? I'm seeing no indications. So uh, we will move to the vote. Oh, sorry. Uh, I can offer Councillor Hemsall her right of reply, though she has nothing to reply to. So, but. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Move to the vote. Can I remind members not to press your buttons until you have opened the vote, and please be aware that your vote will not be counted when the vote has been closed. Press the green button to vote in favour of the motion and the red button to vote against it. The vote is now open. I'm now closing the vote. The vote has the motion has passed. Forty nine votes, no abstentions, no none against. We'll now move on to motion nine. Motion from Councillor Glenn Bluff. I can ask Councillor Bluff to introduce the item. <coughs> Thanks very much, Chair. Um, I'm pleased to, to say that I'm joined by quite a few members of the public behind me um, who've come from Hickleton and Marr and, and other villages impacted by this motion. Um, I'm also pleased to, in the way I'm going to introduce this, to say that I will take on board Councillor Smith's comments about choose kindness um, by introducing this motion because this motion has been about more than uh, party politics. It has crossed the divide. We've already presented this motion to parish councils that have been affected. And those parish councils, which uh, are across the, the political party spectrum, have voted unanimously 
to back that, which includes several members of, of this chamber as well. So in introducing this motion, um, I hope you, the, the council can support this. It involves residents living on the A635 from Hickleton through Mar to Scoresby, an extremely busy road and one of the most polluted roads in the UK and the most polluted road in Yorkshire. Some months ago, I sat with officers to go through our air quality management plan, and we were more or less told that there is nothing we can do about the air quality situation in Hickleton. It's been monitored for several years, and in that air quality management action plan, the best we could offer was to suggest that there might be a bypass at some point with funding from South Yorkshire Mayoral Authority. However, I don't believe that's the only thing we can do, and that's why I bring this motion today. The air pollution, the noise pollution, and the damage to the conservation area at the expense of the economic development of Barnsley, which is only going to get worse as Barnsley moves to implement its ES10 development over near Highgate. The promised bypass has never come. Councillor Cynthia Ransom has spent many years campaigning for something to be done to give relief to the residents that have been held hostage by the traffic, and some success was done with the introduction of speed cameras in 2021. But more needs to be done, and only more HGVs are going to continue to rattle through these small villages, and they go right through the middle. The issue is set to escalate as the development continues along the Highgate and Goldthorpe area with the ES2 at Barnsley's economic development, but at the expense of the residents of Doncaster. If the South Yorkshire Mayoral Authority will not provide the bypass to Doncaster, residents so desperately need, then I see that this is the only way forward. I urge and so move this motion to the Chamber. Thank you, Councillor Bluff. I understand Councillor Cynthia Ransom is seconding the motion. Do you wish to speak? Yes, please, Chair. Thank you, Chair. I second and fully support this motion and endorse and echo the comments made by Councillor Glenn Bluff. For the past 10 years, I have campaigned with residents of Hittleton and Marr for their health and their safety to address the problem of the A635. Many of the residents are here in the gallery today and I thank them for their attendance. It has been a long journey, comprehensive discussions with the environmental department, highways and road safety to try and address the alarming number of deaths on the road. The Mayor of Doncaster, leader of Barnsley Council, his highway team and Sheffield City Region. We have contributed to the scoping group for the bypass. We were not successful. We have contacted latterly Brodsworth Parish Council, Spotford Parish Council, Hittleton Parish Council, and thank the, um, the other councillors for their support. Barnsley Council have informed us of their plan to develop Goldthorpe up to Billingley, i.e. the Highgate run. Distribution centres, and this is, this is their long-term plan, this would impact dramatically on the A635. This is a severe health risk to our residents. Air pollution is the largest environmental risk to public health. Legislation is in place to improve the air that we breathe. Hittleton is the worst village in Yorkshire for the poor air quality. HGVs account for 70% of air pollution. 10 plus years of talking is enough. For the safety and the health of Hittleton, Marr, Cusworth and Scoresby residents, we need to take action. I therefore support this motion, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Cynthia, if any member wishes to comment on this item, please indicate now. I'll begin with Council Sarah Smith. Thanks, Chair. I'd like to propose an amendment to the motion. As a person who is truly passionate about reducing air pollution, I absolutely understand the thought behind this motion. However, my concern would be that we would simply be moving the problem to other roads and areas within the North Doncaster area, including 
the Adwick and Carcroft Ward, specifically the Woodlands and Adwick area, as stated in the original wording of the motion. There, just to give some facts, the Adwick and Carcroft Ward has the lowest life expectancy in Doncaster, with nearly a 10 years difference between Roman Ridge and the 8.7 years difference with the Sprotborough Ward. Adwick and Carcroft has one of the highest childhood asthma rates uh, in Doncaster, but is the highest in North Doncaster, which is the, as the World Health Organization says, that air pollution is one of the biggest causes of this in young people. Respiratory diseases are the leading cause of premature mor mortality within the Adwick Carcroft Ward, where we have nearly double of England's average rate of people living with respiratory diseases. Furthermore, looking at the data from the Department of Traffic of, Ro of the road traffic statistics of the area, due to the proximity of the A1 and the major roads A63A and B1220, Edward Karkoff Road has a significant more amount of HGV traffic collectively, <laughs> which is significant itself because there is much more higher population of people that live in dense housing areas next to these roads a population of approximately 15 to 16,000 compared to the, the roads mentioned in this motion, which is lower. This is why I'm proposing that we change the motion from an experimental traffic regulation order to explore the potential of a permanent traffic regulation order for the A635 between Higgleton and Scoresby. This would ensure a full consultation with all that would be impacted by it and in my view, it's the fair and proper way. You will see before you proposed alterations to the motion, primarily to ensure that as a council, we follow due process and engage with South Yorkshire Police and National Highways as to whether a TRO would be supported in the first instance. This is the most appropriate and efficient use of limited council resources. We must also remember that it is vital for us as a country to decarbonize our transport network, both to reduce emissions and improve air quality. Our rail network needs significant investment in order to shift freight for, uh, from road to rail. Our bus, work, bus network needs investment to encourage people back to public transport. Our haulage and business sector needs free things from government ambition, commitment, and consistency. The watering down of the 2030 targets by our Prime Minister yesterday show a complete lack of vision and, com and commitment for this great country. Um, but as to state, um, that's why I'm proposing that we change the motion from an experimental one to a permanent one. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Smith. Is the amendment seconded? Councillor Cole. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, I'd like to second the motion. We have, um, we feel a lot of empathy and support for the residents of Hickleton with the problems of air quality that they face. Um, we have, uh, we approved an air quality uh, action plan uh, just a few months ago. We updated it. Um, and there are eight severe areas where there are real serious problems with air quality persistently or certainly at peak times in, in the day. Um, Hickleton is one of those, Ma is one of those, but there are also several other areas as well, from Skello to Conisborough, from Bessica to Bowlby, areas where there are more properties affected than are affected in Hickleton. Um, people living closer to the road than there are in Hickleton. But that said, yeah, people on Low Road Connorsborough live considerably closer to the road than all but five properties on in Hickleton. But that said, this is not about numbers. Every household matters. The quality of life and quality of the air for every household matters. The reason this amendment is important is that if we proceeded with any policy in Doncaster Council without consulting the residents first, the Conservatives would be rightly in uproar about that. It's not the way that you approach things, and it's not least the way that you would begin to approach any highways change at all. So we've tried to put this process in the right order. In the first instance, we would have to consult the police and national highways. The A1M runs right the way through the A635 with junctions on and off. 
So any impact that we make for changes on the A635 has a direct effect on the A1M. We also have um, uh, a large number of vehicles that happen to proceed along the A635 that are going into or towards the centre of Doncaster or in the opposite direction, um, but don't impact on the motorway network. But if we restricted or banned those from that particular road, it would simply divert them onto roads that were often less suitable or more densely populated than that road is as a whole. So it is difficult, this. If it was easily solved, it would have been solved years and years ago. And I think Councillor Ransom said quite rightly that when they applied for funding uh, for a bypass, it didn't meet the government's criteria. They wouldn't put the tens of millions in required. Um, so we need to understand that this is a difficult problem. It's one that the council is going to try to address step by step in a proportionate way. But the key thing about this amendment is that you have to, to get a TRO in place, a traffic regulation order. You have to do it in the correct way and you have to uh, consult very widely, beginning with the important statutory authorities. And then, of course, we would want to involve the parishes, residents, uh, the local businesses, and so on. It's very important. But let's get this process right, which is why we're not opposing this motion. We fully sympathise with the residents, but we do want to make sure that any TRO we bring in is brought in in the right way, so it can't be challenged in court, and if it comes in, it is effective permanently and not simply as an experiment or a temporary measure. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cole. Before we go into debate on the proposed amendment, does anybody wish to speak on the original motion? Councillor Cox? Can we have a 10 minute recess to discuss this, please? Uh, is Council in agreement that we accept a 10 minute recess? Yeah, that's fine. Council is now adjourned for 10 minutes. All right, is everybody back in the chamber? Nobody's missing that anyone expects to be here? Good. Uh, I have asked officers to open the doors upstairs to get a little bit more ventilation going. I know it's a little warm in here. Right, uh, I will start by reading out the proposed amendment uh, for those of you who don't have access to a paper copy of it. The amended motion will read, carry out the necessary statutory consultation, including but not exclusive to the police, emergency services, public transport operators, freight transport association, national highways, local residents, parish councils, traders and community groups to explore a traffic regulation order, TRO, for the A635 between Hickleton and Scoresby. Commit to environmental weight restriction orders, EWROs, to preserve the local area and protect Hickleton, Marr, Scoresby and Cusworth from the adverse effects of noise, vibration, road service deteri surface deterioration and structural impacts. Following the statutory stages of the TRO process and if approved, to carry out a consultation 12 months following its introduction and act as a review to whether the change to change or remove completely. Take the above TRO, subsequent consultations and decision points through the appropriate governance procedures as and when appropriate. Now, does anybody wish to speak on the amendment? Uh, Councillor Bluff, you can speak now, but you only get to speak once, so I would offer you a right of reply before the vote if you want to speak then. It's entirely up to you. Second paragraph, you read commit to an environmental weight restriction order. I, I see the amendment as a commit to explore the potential of. I just wanted to check that. You're quite right, Councillor Bluff. I do apologise. Yeah, so, yeah. Com the second paragraph should read commit to explore the potential of environmental weight restriction orders, EWROs, to preserve the local area and protect Hickleton, Mart, Scoresby, and Cusworth from the adverse effects of noise, vibration, road service deterioration, and structural impact. My apologies for getting that wrong. So, does anybody wish to speak on the amendment? I'm not seeing any indications, so we will then offer Councillor Bluff his right of reply, if he wants to use it. 
I hope I've done this in the right order. Otherwise, I'm going to get shot now. But I had to be educated on this. That's why we took so long. I wasn't having a fag or anything. So I've read through. I'm, I'm very grateful for um, the time it's taken to read this um, from our colleagues across the other side uh, and for their suggestions about the amendment. And I, and I understand that uh, Councillor Cole mentioned about consultation uh, and about making it a permanent order. Um, I'm not quite sure what consultation was done about 20 mile an hour zones, but that's, an, that's another story. Um, my idea behind the experimental order was to collect the data so that we had live data of what was happening before we moved to a permanent order. Uh, and therefore, in, in light of wanting to commit to this, um, I was hoping, and I'm disappointed to see the phrase, explore the potential of. And I, I, ideally, I would like it if we could change the amended motion on that paragraph to commit to environmental weight restrictions order and actually remove the explore the potential of in order so that we're actually committing to something for these residents and we're not just going to do a, a little exercise of let's all think about it and then say no. Okay, is there a seconder for that proposed amendment? Councillor Cox. So this is the part where I might have to be told I'm doing it wrong, but this is what I think happens now. We will go to a vote on Councillor Smith and Councillor Cole's proposed amendment. If that then passes, we will go to into debate and then vote on Councillor Bluff and Councillor Cox's proposed amendment to the amendment. Have I got that right? right excellent. So uh, I will now open the vote on the amend first amendment, Councillor Smith's amendment, plus the green button to vote in favour the red button to vote against, the white button to abstain. Yes. I will now close the vote. We have 50 votes in favor, zero against, and zero abstentions. So, first amendment passes. We now have a proposal and a seconder for a subsequent amendment. Does anybody wish to speak on this? I am seeing no request to speak. I'm hearing some chatter. Have I? Does someone have a problem? So, your amendment. Sorry, the first the Councillor Smith's amendment. Yeah, Councillor Smith's amendment has passed. We are now considering your and Councillor Cox's amendment to the amendment to remove the phrase "explore the potential of." Is that correct? Right. So. Uh, if nobody wishes to speak on that, uh, Councillor Shaw. Thank, thank you. Yeah, it was just to can we could you just read that out again, please? Just what your change is? Is that that's just so, I think so everybody knows what the amendment is. Thanks. Would you like the entire uh, motion from? Yes. So the. What is now the second paragraph will become commit to environmental weight restriction orders, EWROs, to preserve the local area and protect Hickleton, Mar, Scoresby, and Cusworth from the earth adverse effects of noise, vibration, road service, surface deterioration, and structural impacts. Okay, uh, my legal advisor is suggesting from a point of view of sort of legibility, rather than a simple deletion, we replace the phrase, explore the potential of to, to in, and replace that with the word introduce. So it would read, commit to introducing environmental weight restriction orders. So you're happy to accept that amendment to the amendment to the amendment. <laughs> right, so, uh, does anybody wish to speak on that before I offer Councillor Bluff again his right of reply? No? Councillor Bluff, do you wish to take advantage of that? I'm fine with that. Thank you. Thank you. So I will now move to the vote on that amendment. So I'll go back to place with introducing, commit to introducing. 
So press the green boost button to vote in favour of the motion, the red button to vote against, and the white button to abstain. So now closing the vote. So that has failed to pass. We have 36 against, two abstentions, 13 yes. So that amendment fails. So we now have to vote on the substantive motion. Uh, does anybody who hasn't already spoken on the substantive motion wish to speak on it? The amended substantive motion, I should say. Uh, I can then once again offer Council of Bluff his right of reply. Sorry, can, we, can you just read out what the... the it's now as, as on, on the here. paper, but I can read that again if you wish. That now reads, commit to explore, explore the potential, potential of. of, yes. Right, okay. Um, can I just point out, um, I'm not L Bluff, by the way. As much as I, as my, I appreciate my wife, the motion is down on your screen as L Bluff. Oh, right. Uh, um, I, haven't seen I don't know that. if that's just a technical issue, but I don't want it going in the minutes as that. Yes, I'm I don't want sure to get having our, the uh, governance officers will catch that. All right, thank But no, no additional reply. Thank you. Okay, so we are now voting on the amended motion. Once again, press your green button to uh, vote in favour of the motion, the red button to vote against the motion, and the white button to abstain. I'm now closing the vote, and the motion passes, 51 yes, zero abstentions, zero against. Thanks for bearing with me as we got through that. That's probably the most complicated part of this job, is handling amendments. So, let's find where I was. We are now on item 10 of our agenda. Questions by elected members. Questions on notice to the executive. There are two questions on notice which have been received from elected members. Uh, yes, good point, Councillor Shaw. We will take a moment while those who wish to leave the chamber do so. Are we ready to resume? I think Councillor Shaw has just stepped outside. Ah, he's just getting the doors. Is he not coming back in? <laughs> uh, I can wait a moment for him, but not much longer than that. Okay. Um, so we're on to questions to elected members. We have two on record. The first is from Councillor Jane Cox to Councillor Joe Blackham. In Councillor Blackham's absence, Councillor Jones will be answering the question. The question is as follows. Can the cabinet no member please explain how disabled and elderly are going to navigate 12 inch slash 30 centimetre high curbs on Thorn Road Wheatley? They are dangerous, especially as we come to dark nights. How does this stand with the Equalities Act as most curbs are not above 6 inches slash 15 centimetres? Can he also explain how wildlife such as hedgehogs will be able to safely cross the road as the curbs are not only 12 inches slash 30 centimetres high, they are a shape that is concave? Council, uh, Mayor Jones. Oh. <laughs> no problem. Okay. Thank you, Chair. I thought you were uh, moving it on to uh, Councillor Jones, but thank you for your question. So, in relation uh, to your question, uh, Councillor Cox. I am answering this on behalf of Councillor Joe Blackham, who is not here at the moment. Generally, we install curbs with a 125 millimetre upstand to prevent vehicular over and onto the footway and use drop curbs to provide access at strategic positions along the route for people and disabled people. Along Thorn Road, we have installed curbs at a higher level due to the presence of tree roots. However, 
In order to ensure that we meet our equality obligations, we have made provision for dropped crossings at various points along the section of curb, allowing for any members of the public with a disability in particular to be able to safely cross. There is no legislation that would require the Highway Authority to put in provision for hedgehogs, as they do not have a high level of protection, unlike bats, great crested newts, and barn owls. If you do require any further information, please do not hesitate to write to Councillor Joe Blackham. Thank you. Councillor Cox, as Councillor Blackham isn't here, you won't be able to ask a supplementary question at this time. But please put one in writing if so. We now have, sorry, have a question from Councillor Nick Allen to the Mayor of Doncaster. The question is as follows. What are your views on the government's recent announcements regarding nitrous dioxide? Do you welcome the ban? I do, and I know many Bessica Ward residents do too, because of the hugely dangerous impact this substance has on people. Do you feel the ban will be easy to enforce, and will it help reduce the amount of canisters dumped in Doncaster's parks and green spaces? Mayor Jones, would you like to respond? Thank you, Chair, and thank you for your question, Councillor Allen. Nitrous oxide is used as an anaesthetic in medical and dentistry practice, as well as in food production, often referred to as laughing gas. It is also one of the most commonly used recreational drugs amongst young people. Whilst it is rarely associated with addiction issues, the substance abuse of nitrous oxide can lead to harmful effects on an individual's health. For example, repeated use in quick succession can lead to a stroke as oxygen flow to the brain is heavily restricted. I fully support the classification of nitrous oxide as a Class C drug. Under the proposed law change, the unlawful possession of nitrous oxide will carry a sentence of up to two years in prison or a large fine. The proposed change in law still has to go to the House of Lords before receiving royal assent. However, I understand that there is a debate on whether this proposed law change is the best approach to tackle substance misuse. The Advisory Council on the Misuse of Drugs published their evidence review of the harms associated with nitrous oxide in March 2023, which concluded that nitrous oxide should not be subjected to control under the Misuse of Drugs Act 1971 and that the Psychoactive Substances Act 2016 should remain as the appropriate drug legislation. The justification for their position can be found in the review, which I'm happy to share outside of this meeting. This review was sent to the government who have chosen to continue with the proposed classification chain of nitrous oxide to a class C drug under the Misuse of Drugs Act 1971. If approved, the enforcement of this law change would be down to South Yorkshire Police. As there is no proposed legislation on how to regulate the proper sale of nitrous oxide, I suspect the proposed law change may be difficult to enforce in its current state. Nitrous oxide will still be available to purchase online for legitimate reasons such as medicine, dentistry and food production. Unless there is significant legal pressure applied to online retail platforms and social media sites, the sale and distribution of nitrous oxide for recreational use will likely continue. I certainly want to see an end to the canisters being littered, which are a blight on our parks and greens. However, to actually be able to enforce this will be very difficult. Thank you for your questions. Thank you, Ros. Councillor Allen, do you have a supplementary question? And we move on to questions without notice. And questions for Mayor Ros Jones, we have Councillor David Nevitt. Thank you, Chair. I would like to ask the Mayor about the bus service we used to get and the shambles it has become recently in Kirksandal, Edenthorpe and elsewhere. Several residents are asking questions of me and the Council about bus travel on first buses. A resident contacted me. Their child could not get on the bus to school as it was full. 
Two days in four, this resident had to drive their child to school. I'm sure this is not just a problem in my ward, Edenthorpe and Kirk Sandal. The frequency of bus availability has reduced, and the timetable is not available, I am told. Together with road closures in my area, a bad situation has substantially led to reduced availability. Why are these cuts to services so severe? How has this happened? And who can make improvements to give our residents a service to get them to where they need to be, when they need to be there? Councillors used to hold these companies to account on the Transport Authority, but that avenue has dif disappeared. How can we get back to a service not a few buses occasionally. Thank you, Councillor Nevert. Mayor Jones. Thank you for your question, Councillor Nevert. I would suggest you direct your queries and constituents to Oliver Coppard, the Mayor of South Yorkshire and the Passenger Transport Executive. And I am aware that Mayor Coppard is holding meetings throughout uh, South Yorkshire, but also here in Doncaster and raise their concerns. It is, however, up to bus companies to decide on bus routes at the moment, frequencies and fair prices. South Yorkshire Mayoral Combined Authority is providing significant subsidy in order to protect some of the bus routes that face the acts. This public subsidy is not sustainable. Government need to provide significant investment for the bus network in South Yorkshire. Boris Johnson as Prime Minister promised to bus back better and to bring about London style bus networks across the country as part of his levelling up agenda. We are still awaiting for this investment but monies put into public transport can only do good and get people out of the cars using good clean public transport but thank you for your question. Thank you, Ros. Councillor Nevert, do you have a supplementary question? Our next question is from Councillor Jane Cox. On Bank Holiday Monday, I went to a new bar in Doncaster City Centre with some friends and family. We were there from 4 o'clock in the afternoon to about 6 o'clock in the evening. In this time, we saw drug dealing, drug taking, what we believe was fencing of stolen goods and begging. People entered the bar asking us for money and cigarettes. In this time, we saw no one, we saw no one in authority enter Doncaster City Centre, neither the police nor an officer from Doncaster Council. Does the Mayor think this is acceptable? And why on earth do we expect people to go into the town when it is what they're subject to? Thank you. Mayor Jones. We will continue to work with the police and have been informed that the police will actually have additional resources in October. None of this is acceptable, but we continue to work and ensure that we have a service that wraps around with people with chaotic lives. So we all want to see this removed, but this is not only in Doncaster city center, but most places you go throughout the country, you're seeing the same. But no, we will continue to strive to avoid this happening when people go out and actually get people from their chaotic lives into a better life. Thank you for your question. Thank you, Ross. Jane, do you have a supplementary question? Uh, just, just to say, I completely understand it's a nationwide problem, but I live in Doncaster and I want to support businesses in Doncaster. And the bar we went to was opened by a neighbour who we were supporting and he's invested an awful lot of money in our town centre. And, you know, it's just, it's not fair. It's, it's not fair what they're up against. I live in Doncaster, and as I've said, what we will seek to do is ensure we get more of the police as they come in doing the proper patrolling, because it's in partnership that we will overcome this. But let's be honest, this will not go away overnight, and we will have to continue to work and strive to get people out of their chaotic lifestyle into proper modes of working. Thank you. We have a question from Councillor Nick Allen. Um, <clears throat> could, oh. Wow. Is that working now? Um, could the charges that are levelled on um, certain lakeside residents for the uh, administration and uh, maintenance of the 
lake, could they in future ever be amended to include an itemised breakdown of costs? Because I think it's been brought to my attention that a resident received three years' worth of bills uh, recently effectively in one go and I know they've disputed it and that's being worked on but it does seem there are two uh, parts of Lakeside, Windscar and then over the boundary somewhere else where the, um, the way they're administered by the council isn't necessarily always clear, it could be made clearer. I support that people should know what they're paying for and therefore I will seek to get itemised bills where we've got that information. Do you have a supplementary question? Does anybody else have any questions for Mayor Oz Jones? Does anybody have any questions for Deputy Mayor Councillor Glyn Jones? Councillor Allen. Thank you. I hope it works this time. Right. Um, I know we've all become aware of uh, correspondence we've either been copied into or received directly or uh, at least been privy to as members from a certain individual who uh, emails infrequently about his experiences of racism in Doncaster. And I did ask his permission before asking this question. I don't intend to uh, name him. It's just I've not been copied into any answers to any of his emails. I therefore assume that his correspondence remains ignored. Um, given the nature of certain aspects of the um, disclosures he makes and certain allegations he makes, uh, would you be willing perhaps to have a look at them in a more detailed way um, respond and investigate certain allegations he's made, certainly about Doncaster's recruitment policies or practices, because uh, I feel, you know, if you, if you were to investigate them, maybe his uh, allegations, you know, or, um, you know, would bring to light certain aspects of what he's saying, and um, he, might not, uh, he might not see the need to email us quite so frequently. Councillor Jones. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Yeah, uh, we always uh, try and tackle, uh, well, we always do tackle issues around racism, et cetera, head on, because it's not acceptable. Uh, and if that's found to be part of our uh, recruitment processes and practices, which I'm sure it isn't, because we've looked at this before, then therefore it will be tackled uh, at the right time, at the right committee, by the right people. But I'm sure that doesn't happen uh, currently under, with our procedures. I uh, would probably need more information from you, Councillor Allen, as to the issues that you're raising. Uh, but uh, it's, it's something that I personally find uh, particularly abhorrent. I, uh, there's nobody probably done more over the last 20 years to fight the equalities agenda in all aspects of that and, and move that uh, agenda forward. So I do find it uh, alarming that these uh, allegations are made and that they aren't followed up uh, at the right time. I'm sure they are. I, I think I know uh, the individual you're talking about and I believe that individual has regular meetings uh, with, with the chief exec uh, and has a, uh, a, a specific point of contact. So other than that, councillor, I, I don't really know where we can take it, uh, but I know I find it personally abhorrent. So uh, it's one of those issues that we uh, have, to, have to tackle and have to face, uh, and that goes across all issues of uh, whether it's race, gender, sexual, sexuality, disability, age, sexual orientation, gender reassignment, religion, pregnancy and maternity. It cuts the entire spectrum. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you, Councillor Jones. Councillor Aaron, do you have a supplementary question? Go ahead. Uh, do you believe, therefore, that the SPOC policy is being applied appropriately in relation to this type of issue or uh, if you're not willing to comment now obviously you don't have to but I, I personally don't feel that the SPOC policy is an appropriate route to go down and I would like to sort of advocate that on behalf of the resident uh, Councillor uh, Jones uh, Damien Allen is going to speak on this uh, Thank you Councillor Allen um, in terms of do we think it's an appropriate route uh, there is a long history involving the individual uh, in question with regards to the substance and the nature 
of the points that are raised, they are all taken into account. There is a regular process of correspondence and engagement where there are new issues that are raised, those are responded to. Uh, the rationale behind the SPOC is very clear uh, and the application of it and the purpose for its use, I am confident and comfortable was applied in the right way. There is a review process and for the nature of this individual that will take place in November on its annual anniversary. Thank you, Damien. Do we have any additional questions for Councillor Glyn Jones? Uh, Councillor Bluff. Thank you. Um, it's not so much a question for Councillor Glyn Jones, but I would just like to ask if the Chair could ask Councillor Cole to stop playing his Angry Birds. I don't mind him doing it while I'm talking, but while the Mayor and the Deputy Mayor are talking, I find it most rude to, for him to be on his phone. Nobody should be on their phones. I don't know who is or who isn't, but nobody should be. Everyone should be paying attention to the meeting. Some people, of course, use electronic devices to have their agenda and meeting papers with them. So that is something to bear in mind. Do we... <coughs> Councillor Bluff? Why is him typing? I can hear it from here. As long as he's not disturbing the conduct of the meeting, I... Very well. Let us have no typing within the meeting then. Back onto our agenda. Does anyone have any questions for the Deputy Mayor? Does anybody have any questions for Councillor Laney Mabel? Questions for Councillor Nigel Bull? Councillor Ransom. Thank you, Chair. Sorry, Councillor. Um, could you, could the Cabinet member um, please say why Doncaster was one of the few authorities that did not sign up to the National Reading Challenge this year? And is this going to be future policy? Yeah. Councillor Bolt. And, yeah, uh, and will the public be informed of this? Yeah, thank you, Councillor Ransom. Um, there is a number of opportunities and there is a number of initiatives that local authorities can sign up to in terms of obviously the reading challenge being one of those. Um, Doncaster Council um, over the last two or three years through its heritage services and obviously through its library has actually signed up to a, a different type um, of initiative. So it's something very similar but it's different and in the sense that um, it it's aimed to sort of like widen literacy and reading in other areas. I'm happy to send you the details of it so you're aware of it, but we, we have got a reading challenge going on, but it's not the same one as a national one. It's different, that's all it is. Thank you, Councillor Ball. Councillor Ransom, do you have a supplementary question? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Ball. So regarding the libraries, which is probably my concern in this, and also the residents that tried to get onto the, um, you know, the national challenge, they were told that their authority was not taking part. So will libraries be informed of this, that you're not taking part in this and you've got something new? Yeah, thank you for that, Councillor. We, we, there is an initiative there in place and it's run through all our communities library and our branch libraries and obviously our, um, our, our main library at Deaglam. Um, but effectively it's, it's a different initiative than the National Reading Challenge. What I can do is I can get you the details on it um, because obviously it's aimed at improving literacy, particularly with young people and children and I'll let you have that so you're aware. If you're telling me that individuals that are visiting the library are unaware of that, that's clearly a problem, and I'll feed that back to the library service because nobody wants to be in that position. So thank you for that. Thank you, Councillor Bull. Any other questions for Councillor Nigel Bull? Any questions for Councillor Joe Blackham or Councillor Rachel Blake shall be submitted in writing to the Executive Office. A response will be provided. Do we have any questions for Councillor Phil Cole? Councillor Bluff. Don't worry, it's not about your phone. Um, I'll be careful what I say, because the free press keep calling me the angry councillor, and I don't like that moniker either. Um, some time ago, I'll, I'll choose Councillor Smith's approach to be kind. Some time ago, planning was passed for a development at Harlington, in the parish of Barnborough and Harlington. 
Cynthia, myself and the Parish Council have expressed anger towards not being consulted on the 106 funds being spent within the parish. They're being spent at Denneby Ings, which is not within the parish of Harlington or Barbara, and not even within our ward. The Parish Council have made repeated requests for details of who and why it was decided to be spent on Denneby Ings, with the loss of amenity being in Harlington. Can you reassure us that the, that the Parish Council and us will have a reply to this? Thank you for your question, Councillor Bluff. The, um, I'm not familiar with the situation you're describing. Obviously, the decisions related to any planning commissions are permissions, are those of the planning committee completely in their quasi-judicial role, independent of any wider policies that the council may have generally. So, um, but if you, um, if you let me know um, the specific application and the specific, um, uh, I'll check into the details and I'll give you a full written reply before we meet again. Supplementary Council Bluff? No, I'd just like to say thank you for that. I'll, I'll supply the details for you. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, any further questions for Council Cole? Do we have any questions for Councillor Mark Holbrook? Do we have any questions for Councillor Jane Nightingale? And do we have any questions for Councillor Sarah Smith? No. Elected members can now put questions to chairs of committee. Do we have any questions for Councillor Austin White, chair of the audit committee? Do we have any questions for Councillor Julie Grace, Chair of Elections and Democratic Structures Committee? Do we have any questions, oh, sorry, any questions for Chair of Health and Wellbeing Board, Councillor Rachel Blake, should be submitted in writing to the Executive Office and response will be provided. Does anyone have any questions for Councillor Jane Kidd, Chair of OSMC? No. Then item 11 is approval of councillor's absence. The purpose of this report is to note the action taken by the monitoring officer, Scott Forkus, who was acting under delegated authority and in accordance with section 85 of the Local Government Act 1972 to improve the request from councillor Rob Reed for an extension of absence from attendance at meetings due to ill health. Does any member wish to speak on this item? Is the item noted? Item, item 12, minutes of joint authorities for information only, not endorsement. Does any member wish to speak on this item? You will notice that these have now become a digital link rather than about 50 pages worth of notes. Nobody wishes to speak. Uh, can I ask that they be noted? They are noted. Members, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes the business of today's meeting. I now declare the meeting closed. <laughs>